It was a few weeks ago after Circuit Baker started. Pa asked me to buy more diapers, even though he has a whole cupboard full. He doesn't even use them. When I got to the mall, the queue was past 7-Eleven, all the way to the car park. At the front, they stood behind the red line exactly one meter apart. But in the car park, they used their imagination. And some people have no clue how long one meter is. After 20 minutes, I almost gave up. Then I heard someone call out, Miss Fern, Miss Fern. It was Dick May, my neighbor, in his trademark sleeveless white vest. Now normally, when I see Tick Ming, I walk in the other direction. Because white vests are so common, and I know he has a thing for me. He was also in the queue. Four people in front. One of them an old auntie with a little red trolley. Easy meat. Casually, I walked over. Tick Ming, what are you doing here? I asked. Buying toilet roll, he said. I don't like to say the word diapers in public, so I replied, yeah, me too. Must stock up before it's all gone. Then we made small talk about the weather and the price of vegetables. Suddenly, somebody said, hey, you cannot cut Q. It was the old auntie. I never cut Q, I said. You did, she said. I saw you, and it is illegal for people from different households to meet. You are breaking the law. If you don't leave, I will report you. Then she pursed her lips together like two fat sausages. <laughs> Who was she? This sausage lip auntie. Who made her line monitor? And anyway, how could she have seen me when she was standing in front? Did she have eyes at the back of her head? We are not breaking the law, I said, because we are together. Take me wanted to say something, but before he could, the auntie pushed the trolley towards me and said, even if you are together, when shopping for essential services, you must go alone. You are still breaking the law. It is my civic duty to report you. Wow. <laughs> that was it, the last straw. I couldn't take it. One meter apart, I shouted and pushed the trolley towards her. Unfortunately, I don't know my own strength and the trolley ran over her toes. I don't know what happened next, who hit who first or how I fell to the ground. But when I woke, someone was lifting my head, fixing my mask back onto my face. He had the softest eyes I'd ever seen. That is how I met George. Now, I like to go on Saturday mornings. Because that is when most people do their shopping and the queue is the longest. The longer the queue, the more time I have to look at George. George. With his ramrod straight back. Shiny bald head. And soft, soft eyes. Nowadays, men have such funny names like Romeo or Jem. But George is a proper name. A manly name, like King George, George Washington, George Michael. Each time the queue moves forward, I think how I'm one step closer to standing in front of him so he can lean in with his thermometer and those soft eyes and announce, Normal. <laughs> Oh, the first time I had to use the QR code, I was completely lost. But George was so patient, he told me, Never mind. And even offered me a pen from his breast pocket. I could feel his eyes on me as I signed my name. Fun is a nice name, he said. And I felt myself tremble. Even though his mouth is hidden behind his mask, I can tell you, George has a nice smile. My mother once told me, you can tell if a person smiles by the number of crow feet they have, and he has a lot. Through his latex gloves, I can see his hands are gentle, with long fingers and well-groomed nails. That's another thing my mother taught me. Funny, she said. Ask yourself, 
do you want to be held like a sack of rice or a slab of tofu? Look at the hands and you'll know. The other day, I took out one of my old lipsticks, stuck in love. I also took out a few of my dresses. No point wearing lipstick with shorts and t-shirt. Most of my dresses have high necks because mother always said, cleavage is for prostitutes, Fanny. I cut off the neck and created an off-shoulder scallop affair to show off my collarbones. I think George likes my floral dress, the one with the pink azalea print, because he definitely took longer than necessary reading my temperature. Today was so hot, I saw beads of sweat on his forehead slide down the side of his face. My temperature shot up to 37.8 degrees. George didn't allow me to go in. He told me to stand at the side in the shade to cool off. I didn't mind. I could be closer to him for longer. By the time I was ready to go in, his colleague came to relieve him of his duties. I say colleague, but this man is no substitute. When someone wanted to borrow a pen, he offered it from his trouser pocket. Can you believe it? I refused to go in. As I was leaving, I saw this man slumped against the wall, having a cigarette. Was it George? <laughs> People look so different with their masks off. I wandered, lonely as a cloud, around the CBD, whose streets, which always held a crowd, were empty as can be. I must admit, it felt quite strange to walk the streets alone, but then it helped me feel the change my world has never known. My steps were brisk as I strode down the vacant thoroughfare where I, the queen of Chinatown, Jay walked without a care. I strode past many sad cafes, now shuttered and morose, and thought about their better days now that they're comatose. I hoped they soon would be revived and pondered wearily. God, please help me survive without my bubble tea! With nothing else to mar my view, my eyes were turned toward the landscape I thought I outgrew, of which I did get bored. But now, the edifices rose as architecture knew, and silently, I yelled bravos at their renewed debut. I toured the town with eyes afresh and marveled at the plan I now encountered in the flesh a well-bedazzled fan. I suddenly thought of the test of what it must have been to turn this aisle into the best the world has ever seen. And in my new pride, as I did bask, a horror I did see. A pioneer man, unclad of mask, was coming towards me. I froze in my steps, unsure of what to do, heartbeat strong. Should I continue, play along and whimper? How'd you do? I started manically thinking, my senses in panic. Perhaps I'll do the righteous thing. Take an iPhone pick? With each slow step, he ambled near. Potential infector. And I approached him. Sweating fear, my vision now a blur. And as he came close, I plucked my brawn and pointed to my mask. He nodded, smiled, and put his on. I only had to ask. I smiled and gaily skipped away, enlightened by the scene. You know, I never thought I'd see the day when no one would be mean. So 
I moved on into the heart of my treasured city, along the roads where once ox carts plowed up and down freely. I turned a corner and emerged beside a driveway wide. Here, uncontrolled, my feelings surged in show of national pride. Our city hall stood silently before a swath of green, a symbol of our being free from colonizers keen. I crossed the padang to the shrine built for our wartime dead, but once the esplanade coastline belied the war's bloodshed. Imagine too, there was a beach left by my countrymen, where now there stood within my reach the double durian. I paid my dues, not breaking stride to where my culture bloomed, where truly my art could be plied, but once there was no room, I pondered, grateful as I passed the hub for arts to hum, and almost noisily broadcast, how very far we have come. <laughs> the early years were fraught with fear that boss would disapprove. A ruling many thought severe. You are not allowed to groove. <laughs> and although it did come as a shock, I knew big brother should be watching over like a hawk, like any parent would. But then, those were the early days when footing was unsure. But now, I'm glad we found the ways to blossom year by year. Next, I arrived at somewhere then did clearly represent the magic outcome you see when a country reinvents. The realization of a dream manifested today. The bold design, the plan, the scheme, the great Marina Bay. I pass the floating platform where our NDPs are held. Come August, hand to heart, we'd swear allegiance as tears well. I had to pause to take it in. This glistening skyline that so easily forgave the sins of rules and laws and fines. Until my reverie was crushed by joggers panting by. The stay-home workers morning rush, pretending they can fly. Well, I hurried past a dripping mob and headed for the bangs of sentinels that once did throb. For which I gave my thanks. Now, back again on Shenton Way, the morning breeze still cool, the huge respect I must repay rendered me minuscule. I slowed my pace as I drew near the markets that still thrive, the neighborhood I hold so dear that makes me feel alive. And I mingled, though with distancing, and joined the quiet queue, still winging in the swing of things, part of the city's glue. And soon, with groceries in hand and breakfast takeaway, I strolled back to my old heartland, pleased with my start of day. And I saw the sky so strangely clear from my new perspective that showed me all that I hold dear is in this life I live. Some days the days don't matter, sometimes the time don't tell. The rings have been stripped like a plane of platoons at a standstill waiting for orders. <laughs> the dire need to consume the night and day, the dire need to touch and be felt, the dire die. My thoughts crumble as I think about what confines you as a human being, what constructs a human being. These walls came up and stripped me of what is fundamental, stripped me of my privilege.
I could be on that date or having a meal with those who matter or huh? Huh? okay <coughs> Allah Akbar Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillahirrahmanirrahim Maliki yawmiddin Iyya kena budu wa iyya kena stayin Ihdina sirat al-mustakim Sirat al-lazihin an'am ta'alaykim Wa yaril magdubu biyalaykim Walad-tolin Amin Sovereign of the day of recompense, mercy. Mercifully, I am what they call a normal person. You know, common, standard, wanted, regular, typical, day to day, uh, traditional, run of the mill, a dime a dozen. Fix. A person who is conventional and healthy. What can a person do now to feel normal again? <sighs> Moods are always bad. I hardly talk these days. I couldn't sleep. <laughs> Only until I'm physically at the edge. I wake up feeling heavy and dreadful. I'm, I'm losing it. <sighs> I'm losing it. <sighs> I feel disabled. No, really, I feel disabled. I cannot produce, I cannot rap, I cannot write a monologue. I, I cannot, I, can, I cannot write a monologue. Huh? What? Okay. Allah Akbar Qul a'udhu bi rabbin nas Malikin nas Ilahin nas Min syaril waswasil ghanas Lazihi wasmis fi sudurin nas Najin When the door opens, I want to be far away from these walls and be back under the sun. I want to see those who are in my heart, those who arouse me to be relish and devoured, to be an occupant of a vacant space. a mustang galloping through the uncharted wilderness for miles only to be halted and tied to a hitching post doesn't matter what walls we are up against. The limitation of life revolves around the limitation we are given. How about you finally know what it's like to cannot do a certain thing and be made to adapt to a different lifestyle to grow within the can't do's. Maybe the cannot do's is the new normal. The new normal that is to be given the bare necessity to be alive.
to live but not a life to live but n- not a life we understand each other right well we have now come to a point where we are all um here you know motor disability or circuit breakers stop you from going out intellectual disability social distancing kept you from socializing an eating disorder or your favorite dining places closes doors declare your disability before the job interview or you lose your job because simply there's no market for you the situation we are given are very much different but the feelings we have towards it are very much the same yes for some of us we have been here all along we finally understand each other right Thank you. Thank you, COVID.